Cool. Thank you. So, uh, as Brian was so kind to say, who am I? I'm Daniel Lindsley. I run Toast Driven, um, and I wrote a couple of Django apps you may or may not have heard of, um, but that's not the point of the talk today. Um, the point of today's talk is talking about APIs and the design of those things. And I'm not talking about HTTP APIs. I love RESTful. I love RESTful APIs, but um, that's not really what I wanted to talk about. What I do want to talk about is programmatic APIs, in-code, library-style things that all of you work on every day, and especially the ones that you're passing off to other people, such as coworkers, if you're distributing it online as open source, if you're selling software to someone else. Um, and so you may be thinking, well, we do this all day long. I know how to go and write a Python method. Why are you talking to me, Daniel? Um, I like to think of this as, uh, usually what'll happen to me is I'll be like, hey, I have to start a new project. I gotta use some libraries I've never heard of before. I'll get started. I'll try and make it work for a little while, and by the end of it, I'm just, agitated and angry, and I, I'm frustrated with how things aren't working for me the way I think they should. Well, the problem is that me being on the end of using someone else's fic fictional library here is actually what you do to everyone else all day, every day. And those people might be angry at you for the code you've written, and it might not even be other people, it might be you. <laughs> uh, so. The idea is that you know if you write a nice API, nice APIs make me happy. When I write, a, when I use a library that's comfortable and convenient and, and makes things easy and friendly for me, I'm happy, and that happiness probably works for other people. Well, happiness makes people want to talk about your library. They, they're happy. They're excited. They want to tell you know their coworker, hey, check out this great thing. It'll work great for your project, or you know they might tweet about it or something else, and by recommendations, that's a way to expand the audience of whoever is using your library or your third party application. So it might be other people using your open source or you know, people, it might yield business or your coworker might say, hey, this guy did a great job writing this API to your boss, which might end well for you. So I wanna talk about a couple points of philosophy. Um, first of all, you have to accept you cannot ever, ever, ever make everyone happy by default. You just can't do it. Um, this has been a very painful uh, thing I've had to come to terms with. And what, what the real crux of the problem is that when you write some code, you're making assumptions about how it works and the environment in which it's going to be run and used in that don't apply to other people. But you can make, so you know, you write your default happy case, you might make 50% of people happy. More people will be happy with you if not only can they just use your library, but they have ways to extend it or modify the behavior of it in a manner that doesn't, you know, doesn't require forking the software and making changes and then maintaining their own fork and bringing in patches and the, the huge painful process that forks lead. And even more people, maybe even as much as 90% of people, will be happy if it's easy to tweak. And 90% is, is probably just about the best you're gonna do for happiness overall. Uh, another key philosophical point is that when you're writing a library, ideally no copy paste should be needed. If they're running through tutorial materials or it's something particularly involved, like you're writing to an OpenGL context or um, you know, if you have a particularly large set of things that need to happen, or maybe it's something out of a cookbook they can use wholesale, then copy-paste is generally okay. But if you're constantly having to go back to their docs and copy out 10, 20, 30 lines of code and pasting it all over your sources, you're gonna be in a world of hurt. And if you can't internalize an API, it really will hurt adoption and how other people can use it. They also, kind of dovetailing on that point, they shouldn't constantly have to be in your docs. I mean, think about how often you have to spend in document, how much time you have to spend in documentation. If you had to spend all your hours of the day in it just to make something work, you're gonna be kind of frustrated. That said, that's not an excuse not to have good docs. Good docs are a boon to you. It's time you don't have to spend in IRC or on the phone or answering tickets or on mailing lists. And it saves time for the person on the other end because they don't have to wait for a reply. They can go and help themselves. 
and real world use is the best use. If you don't have some real world use and you're just kind of playing architecture astronaut floating in space and making your grandiose vision, you have no actual test for the thing that you're writing to make sure that it's sane and that it works well. So having a real world use case will always generate better code than just architecting for the fun of it. Lastly, you have to accept that no matter what you do, someone is gonna do something crazy with the code you've written. It's going to happen, um, and it's going to be kind of painful. Uh, so the best thing you can do is maybe not deal with the crazy straight away, but at least plan for it and provide extension points and make sure that you know, hooks are available for people who are intent on just doing crazy, <laughs> crazy things. So um, before we get into the actual the tips that I wanted to share, I wanted to talk some approaches on design. There are two main methodologies that lots of people talk about when they talk about designing APIs. There's bottom-up design, where you build a large number of small components, maybe over the course of weeks or months, by maybe even a team, and you gradually make all those little pieces work together after layer after layer until you have finally have a finished product, hence bottom-up. On the other side of things, if I could use Keynote, uh, there's top-down. And top-down involves starting at the very highest level, writing your perfect, idyllic code, and then taking a step down, and then making, writing the underlying code that makes that idyllic code work, and then slowly expanding and expanding and expanding until it works all the way through. Uh, I'm kind of opinionated on this. I think bottom-up sucks. <laughs> Um, some people like it because they can bite off small little chunks, but you're building little pieces. And it may not even be you that's building all of the little pieces. It might be you know, other people on your, your open source team. It might be people who you work with. It might be you in three months adding on another method. And yeah, they all work, especially if you, know, you tested all of these things and, and you have a test week covering it, but do they really work together? Chances are good they don't. Um, this is probably the reason actually why all of us hate PHP as much as we do, because it was grown organically from bottom up without any sensible design or architecture. And there's other reasons, but I, I, I like to feel that top, top down works better for me, because I can write what I think this should look like and make sure that at each level it's very cohesive and flows nicely. You also end up with less duplication. You don't have someone writing a string copy method and then a copy Unicode string method, and well, where does each of them get used, and are they, is it all correct and consistent, and you know, what bugs do we have that now Unicode strings don't work? And it helps you resist the urge to just duct tape stuff together. It's really easy when you write bottom up to just kind of you know, make a bunch of little pieces and just kind of wrap it all together, throw it in like a, a common you know, gist or something that people use all over and call it a day. But if you can resist that, you can end up with a better finished product. Another bonus to top down, if you're a tester, you get instant TDD because you can start with this idyllic perfect code that you know, doesn't obviously work yet and immediately turn it right into test cases. And yeah, you've got a red suite, nothing's passing, but getting it to pass is not a hard thing, and you have tests from the get-go that are making sure everything is working. That also means that if you've started your coverage early and it's covering everything, when you go to refactor, which you will, you'll get 50% of the way through, go, boneheaded mistake, ugh, and go rewrite everything, that you actually can make things go and not break everything in the process. So, um, I've compiled a small list of things out of the pain of experience that I kind of wanted to share with all of you. Uh, so here's some things I think you should do. One, you should be using small components. Uh, as I put on the slide, it works for Unix because you can take small focused things and make them work together to produce a more, a greater whole essentially. So an example of something I consider to be uh, a poor example of using small components is this amazing do everything class. It updates a cache, who knows what data it's storing. It posts to Twitter because we're social and I guess it can make a sandwich too. This is bad because we don't know what do everything does, but chances are good that warming a cache 
and posting to Twitter probably don't really belong in the same place. And so what I would recommend is taking those things and con making small containers out of them, small components. So we pull out the cacheable code and maybe that becomes some sort of mix-in that we can use on our models. And the social posts becomes its own object that you know maybe the views use or something else. The idea being that as soon as you make things smaller, you stop having so many side effects and start yielding something that really can stand on its own. And you write you know, your tests and everything is great. Uh, I feel that composition is better than inheritance. Um, a key example of inheritance is how class-based views in Django currently work. And it's great to start out with, and you'll have your, your nice inheritance tree, and you'll be pulling all kinds of behavior from all your different parents. And then you'll get down to a certain level, and you'll be like, hey, I want to go write my git method. And oh, crap, both the cached view and the ghetto API view both implement a get method and I can't call both just through inheritance. And then you end up having to hack around and build things that you know, work differently. Whereas if you use composition, you have a parent class that doesn't know anything about caching, doesn't know anything about you know, creating a, a API, but just has some child objects that it knows about, can instantiate and then pass off things to them and just say, hey, can you go do this for me? You're way better at this than I am, and I'll just take the result and keep processing. Uh, another key point is having some sort of reflection. Um, a perfect example of this sort of thing is being able to set some sort of data on an object, but you can't get that data back in some way. Uh, so here we've got a fake date object and it returns an ISO 8801 date by just joining the year, month, and day together and returning them. Well, that's great because that's useful in you know, web pages or when presenting to um, you know, European countries, but if you've got one of these dates, this doesn't do you any good because you have to write your own manual code to nor in order to rip apart a date like this and then rebuild this object. What you want to be doing is you want to have some sort of reflection in your API so that things that you can do, you can also undo, or you can round trip data through the code objects themselves. So in this case, from ISO 8801 can take that same date that comes out of the to method and be able to rip it apart and you know, rebuild the object. Obviously, this is a simple example because it's got to fit on the slide, but I'm sure you can think of plenty of examples where you've tried to do something with an object and it's just not there, even though the opposite is present. Uh, another concept is broad familiarity. Most everyone here probably uses Django since you know, you're at Django Con. But uh, if there's an API that is similar that you know someone else has f experience with, it may benefit you to build your API in a manner that greatly resembles what they know. For instance, we're all familiar with forms and models, the admin or you know, query sets. If you have something that you know, takes user data and validates it, imitating forms API makes a lot of sense because it's something that's very similar. Let's take the example of search, because I don't know anything about this. Um, an example of this, this, this could be you know, perfectly working code if there was you know, implemented behaviors in there, but what we have is something that hits a backend and fetches results. That sounds an awful lot like what the ORM does. So rather than having you know, crazy named methods with inconsistent UR parameters and you know, an entirely custom API, it makes a lot of sense, since the people I'm targeting know Django, to imitate the query set API and then provide methods that are familiar to them so that when they go to use it, there's less conceptual overhead in what they're trying to produce. Um, on the opposite side of things, there's narrow familiarity. Broad familiarity deals with things you know of from other projects. Narrow familiarity is, you know, method to method in your own code. How similar are they? So going back to a search example, you may have something like the go search method, which takes, you know, an engine URL, which is required to, you know, hit up some other engine, and a query string, and then some optional parameters. But then you've got this execute raw query uh, method that's doing kind of the same thing. I mean, it's really just getting results, but takes wildly different parameters, is named completely different. You're doing 
the people who use your library no favors by doing this sort of thing. So in my opinion, a better way to do this is rely on similarly named methods if you're going to insist on methods and make sure that parameter orders are similar because both of these are just running queries. I mean, they both absolutely need to know what an engine URL is that they can hit with an HTTP request. They both need a query. They can't do their work without it. So it makes sense to keep those in the same order and pass the same way to both methods. And then again, you know, you may have differing, you know, uh, keyword arguments, but those are things that you should try to probably keep in the similar order. Uh, protocol. We won't talk about specifically like Java style protocols where everything blows up if you don't implement it perfectly, but protocols in the land of Django make a lot of sense because we deal with pluggable backends a lot of the time. And so maybe we're writing some NoSQL uh, data store and we you know, have some logic in the base class and then there's a Redis backend and a React backend that can access the data. Well, this is great except for the git and the git hash methods don't really line up neatly. So if I go and implement something using the Redis backend and then need to switch to React for more scale, uh, I'm gonna have to go and rewrite all of my code. And that, that sucks from an end user perspective because you can't just transparently switch between things. A far better way is to push your protocol down into your base object, make sure that it has some standardized ways that uh, ch child classes should implement things, and then make sure that those child classes actually implement things the same way so that people don't have to rewrite all their code and so that you aren't introducing crazy bugs. And lastly, you should assume the worst, uh, especially when you're going for that initial blush at you know, how the API should look and how it should work. It's really easy just to be like, well, I just have to go pull some data off this API and I only will ever need like the first 10 results and everything will be nicely formatted for me so it's like three lines of code. Yes, I win, except it's never that easy in the real world and someone's going to come back with requirements that have changed or things that don't work the way you think they should. Perfect example, I'm sure many of us have written a method like this before. I'm just gonna parse out a name Everybody has just a single first name and single last name, right? Oh, wait, no. So what you want to do is, it's, there's nothing wrong with planning for that in the beginning and, and designing an idyllic case, but what you want to do is you also want to think ahead and plan for things that won't go quite so well. So for instance, we may be dealing with a case where you know, the separator isn't a space, it might be a comma, or you may have some other weird kind of um, delimitation. Maybe we know enough to say, hey, middle names are present here, we can change up how we parse and get something more accurate out of it. And you want to, we're assuming, we're, we're planning for, you know, a, a really bad case, honestly, but we can make it nice so that the good case still flows smoothly. So now that I said some things that you should do, I want to cover some things that you definitely should not do. Uh, one of the things that frustrates me is when people implementing a library stop at too low of a level. Like they'll get their initial underlying API code in place. It just works and they're like, mm, good enough, we're done. You didn't need any conveniences or anything, did you? You don't mind, you know, opening up a socket for me that works and has the right timeout, right? Yeah, that, that, this doesn't really help people who are new to your library, who've only ever put the URL in their browser before and just want to you know, get a page back. So rather than stopping at a low level, what you should do is build that low level so that it works, make sure everything's functioning, and then see, take a step back and look at it and say, where can I improve this? Where are my pain points in trying to use this library? and layer on additional conveniences so that it isn't so painful to use. So for instance, somebody could now say, hey, get page, all I know is this URL, I want google.com, can you please go get it, and it'll work for them. They get quick wins, they can prove that your library works, and they are then willing to spend more time with it. Uh, wildly different return values, they suck. If your method can return an integer or a a tuple or a dict or a class, 
and I have to guess which one it's going to be this time, that, that hurts a lot. So what you want to do is, for as much as it makes sense, standardize return values so that it doesn't hurt people trying to implement this and that they can make assumptions about the right things that are coming out. For instance, back to a search kind of example, we had a tuple being returned before an account and then a, so a dictionary coming out of a different method, but they're both still just returning basically the same kinds of data. So in this case, we pull those out and we're returning a dictionary that has standardized keywords between both of them so that when you're dealing with a query and you have to convert it to a raw query in your code, there's no real substantial pain involved. It's a very natural thing. Um, the choice to use a dictionary here is maybe beneficial because you know it may come back later on that someone wants to add highlighting to what comes out and have highlighted snippets and that's just adding another key. It doesn't break any existing code. No one has to rely on tuple ordering as it comes out, and they can move on with their day. Uh, another thing you should not do is useless implementation code. I'm talking, this is more in the realm of like, I'm designing a base class that other things will extend and actually implement the behavior of. Um, For instance, a, a useless version of this is one that just simply says, hey, hands up in the air, I have no idea what any base class is gonna do. I just think this is, this is kind of how you should work and you, know, you go do all the hard work when you implement this subclass. This is almost basically a Java protocol as far as I'm concerned and it hurts because you can't do anything with this. This doesn't, there's no benefit to subclassing base backend in this case because all it does is throw errors. You're gonna have to write everything yourself anyhow. A better technique, in my opinion, is to write a backend that actually functions. Write something that does something, even if it's not web scale or not quite production ready. Something that actually does something and does it a correct enough way and, ha and provides an implementation that other people who are going to make backends or make subclasses can use. In this case, Maybe I want to write XML instead of JSON. All I have to do is override save and uh, load in this case to dump out XML. And yeah, that's not much savings here for this kind of a code example, but if you have a complex in it or maybe some kind of validation or checking of the data, there's wins to be had from subclassing something like this and still gaining the extensibility you need for an effective backend. And lastly, if it's difficult to test, you're gonna be in a world of hurt. Uh, as a prime example, um, we're gonna fetch some uh, current temperature information for a given weather station off uh, NOAA's website and display it. Um, if you go to write unit tests for this, you'll, it'll end in tears and maybe a bottle and yeah. Um, it, yeah, you just don't wanna do that because either you're gonna be hitting the network and you know, your tests are gonna be slow or you're gonna have to, for every test you wanna do of this, do a bunch of mocking and then you're gonna start deciding, well, I didn't really need tests for this. It probably won't break in production and then you're getting a phone call at 3 a.m. and your boss is mad. Um, so what I would suggest doing is whenever you have a complex piece of code, it's not that you shouldn't write that piece of code to get started, but you should step back and say, hey, maybe this is too involved. I need to break this up. So a pattern I like a lot is taking um, code that is in you know, a big massive method or hertz or something and breaking it down and, and turning basically Python classes into little modules that I can use. There may never be more than one instance of this running at any time in an application, but these little methods are extremely easy to test. Build URL, I can just hand it a station code and make sure that you know, what comes out is exactly right. I don't have to mock the underlying requests library or you know, change things up in PyQuery or supply a full thing of HTML to test this to make sure it's right. Similarly, fetch page, yeah, that's hard. I'm gonna have to use a mock here to keep my tests fast, but I don't have to do it for any of the rest of my tests and it's much easier to test error conditions coming out of this because this is, this is very foolish code. It's assuming, hey, I'm gonna get a 200, there's gonna be valid data coming back you, you're not testing any of the error conditions, you're not testing 404s, you're not testing, hey, I got a 200, but this isn't actually you know, weather data. And so by breaking things down into more 
modular code, you're going to get big testing wins if for no other reason. So um, off of Python specific topics and onto Django ones, first, I think you should pluggable backend all the things. Um, I really like pluggable backends, uh, especially the um, ORM and the caching backends because it enables people to extend behavior and supply new code without having you know, severe overhead or having to rewrite all of their application code. Uh, you should also internationalize heavily because you're gonna save yourself a lot of time and really it's so easy in Django to at least just mark things for translation that there's really no reason not to do it. And I'm guilty of not having you know, done it enough in practice myself, but it's a really solid way to make things more friendly for other people because not everyone speaks English, obviously. Um, dynamically loadable classes and code. If you've ever dove into how uh, the admin does auto discover, it has this nice pattern of basically being able to take a Python path as a string and ripping it apart and then being able to dynamically import code and use it. And the benefit of this is that, you know, discovery becomes a very simple task as well as enabling people to plug in wildly different things that you couldn't have hoped to have planned for from the get-go. And instead, you let them hand you a string or something else or perhaps a loaded Python module and you go from there in using it. Uh, we all use declarative syntax all the time, models and forms and to an extent the admin. It's something that's very ingrained in the Django community. So if the, app, if the application you're working on uh, makes sense to be using something like this, it'll help people who are using your code because just due to f uh, familiarity with things that you know use fields or um, do some kind of uh, data storage that's very specific to what's going on. However, you should not metaclass all the things because that yields in headaches and pain. And lastly, whether you like it or hate it, the ORM is a really great place to pick up a lot of very interesting concepts. There's basically everything in this talk you could argue is present at some point in the ORM. And whether, you know, whether you're really happy with it or you just want to use some SQL alchemy or something, there's a lot of great learning opportunities there. Uh, lastly, just a couple other ideas. Um, global state, if you were in Alex's talk earlier this morning, uh, you found out how much he hates it. I hate it almost as much as Alex does. Um, I think it's okay to have some global state, but really what you should be doing is rather than using that global state throughout all of your methods or all of your classes, find ways to let that be injected through maybe initialization parameters or keyword arguments such that you're not just leaning on the global being the right thing but it's there for convenience. Uh, I like to decrease reliance on self when I'm writing classes. Uh, with the weather example, it'd be really easy just to store you know, the station, the URL, and the content all in instance variables and then not have to pass around the data. The problem with that is that when you think about weather, weather is a current temperature or a current wind speed. It's not HTML that came off some government website. And so what I like to do is as little as possible rely on self for storing data because when you rely on self, you're relying on side effects. And when you go to test something like that, you're going to be stuck having to call five methods to initialize something the right way and get the data in just the right condition before you can run the test case. And it makes things painful. And resist the user, resist the urge Oh my goodness, to use magic. Um, this kind of get back, gets back to that point about how you should plan for the worst. If your API can do everything and it just has to be a little explicit to get there, that's generally okay for virtually everyone. But if you just design in the, the shortcut way, you're gonna make somebody very grumpy who otherwise would have been very happy with you. So. In conclusion, I think you should use the golden rule, code onto others as you would have them code onto you. I think consistency is key through all levels of the API. You should plan for the worst, as I said, and inclu include some nice layers on top of that to make life better and make something that you'd love and make it better. Thanks.
Any questions? So since you've been maintaining these uh, pretty popular projects for a while, could you talk a little bit about how you maintain things over time so you don't strand everybody who adopts version one of your project when you decide that you need a little extra polish? Sure. Um, so as I see things, um, maintaining backward compatibility is really hard to, to start off with. It's, it's a very painful, very um, low appreciation task. Um, planning ahead makes a world of difference and, and the reason why I lean so heavily on top-down kind of design is because when I write everything ahead of time, I literally sit down and write out the exact implementation code I think I want. Like what would be my perfect way to use this? And then start ripping it apart and think, start thinking about all the terrible things people are gonna do with it. Um, and really just imagine that literally there's a devil sitting there that's gonna poke me every time I mess up. Um, making sure you can accept flexible initialization, flexible keyword arguments. Um, yeah, the, the keyword arguments are kind of, they're both the nice answer and the easy way out, like kind of the, the cheat, because it's like, oh, hey, we need to support something we didn't before. Oh, let's just toss on a keyword argument. That'll be okay, right? Um, that tends to bite you later on because of how keyword arguments get checked or how they're passed to super calls and stuff like that. But um, another way is just through using composition. I mean, when, when I write something, I may have a very basic implementation planned. And I don't have you know, an advanced way that this could be used. But by leaning on that child object to do the right thing, you can essentially kind of duck some of the early pressure and push it off till a little bit later on. And you'll still find that you know, things don't work right or that you found a case that you, know, you just can't shoehorn in. And at that point it becomes, well, either I change the signature and break everyone else's code or I provide some kind of upgrade path and you know, build in a compatibility shim until you know, a certain release in the future when I can just phase it out. So thanks a lot for the talk. I really enjoyed most of the tips, uh, but I was a little bit concerned by your example towards the end. Um, I think it was at PyCon this past year there was a talk about, you know, or entitled, Stop Writing Classes. Um, and like, I kind of think of classes as being a way to encapsulate state, but then at the end, so you, you, know, you broke up your big function into class with a mm. bunch of methods, which I agree is better. Um, but then you were talking about that like, don't actually use the state of the class, instead just pa pass all your arguments in, which is something Alex Gaynor was talking about this morning and I agree with. Um, I'm wondering why that example was on a class and what you think about, I mean, there's the advantage of classes you can inherit from, but also you can also just write your own functions. Sure, so the problem with just writing functions is if you want something to be configurable, you either have to do the Python version of dependency injection, which is either, you know, you, you've got a couple options. You can pass a, a function as an argument because hey, yay, first class functions. Um, you could, uh, the, this will be better if I can just show and not stumble over my words. Here, uh, fetcher can take the git raw page. That's the, that's the function above it. And this is like the Python version of dependency injection. We don't need frameworks, just pass the function along that you want to use and you want to be calling. Uh, the problem is that if you go with a pure function-based standpoint, there's, it's difficult to inject different behaviors because either you have to be passing this or you have to be patching something out or, I don't know, or relying on dynamic code calls. Uh, in my, like, this is coming from the experience of having to write things that other people will use and, like, wildly mangle in the process of usage. So by putting things into a class, maybe you don't really intend for it to be an object to be used, but what you do have is a nice container that someone can easily override behavior on and still, you know, net 
80% of the code that you know, they're using, just overriding this bit. Um, does that answer? Kind of. It, it, it's a nice way to compartmentalize things for extension. If you're designing something that will never be extended, ha, huh, um, then maybe you don't have to worry about that. But it's, it's an organizational tool and it's a pattern I like, though maybe not everyone should use. All right, thank you, Daniel.